Cool. Well, thank you guys all for coming. My name is Lane Haber. I'm one of the co-founders at Connext, where I focus mostly on the core bridging protocol. And uh, I'm going to give you guys a talk about cross-chain security considerations for the DGEN and all of us. And hopefully by the end of this talk, you guys will be able to come away with some key questions to ask yourself about bridge security. Uh, so first, why is bridge security important? Well, bridge security is more important than most systems because you can be subject to the risk of the bridge when you never even touch that. And what do I mean by that? Well, Polygon, the Polygon POS bridge, the roll-up AMBs, you are, those bridges basically work by locking up assets on one side and delivering you a minted version of those assets that represent a claim on the locked funds. Uh, when everything is backed one to one, this is, works great because you can trade the assets on your destination domain freely and then whenever anybody wants to come back, they can easily just unlock it. Unfortunately, if your bridge is attacked, then what you effectively have are claims on something that don't exist anymore. And you are subject to this contagion risk whenever you are using those assets. So if you're on Polygon and you've with, like purchased POS USDC with your credit card, or you've exited to Polygon from an exchange, you have never used the bridge and you are still sus subject to this contagion risk that exists with the Polygon bridge. And the same thing applies to rollups as well. Uh, well, really any default bridge. So this is kind of just a visualization of the risk that we are, as an industry are exposed to in just a small subset of default bridges. Uh, this, these numbers may have changed. You can see that they are in dollars. Um, but it's, over, it's close to four or five billion dollars uh, of assets that are subject to this type of risk. That's not the, those aren't the only bridges that are getting hacked, are the default bridges. You can see here that like, bridges just keep getting hacked. And in just under 14 months, we've lost like two and a half billion dollars. And I'm sure that I will have to update this slide soon in the future. Uh, and really like why our bridges so easy or like such an appealing target. They're appealing targets because it's new technology. Like I think about this stuff every day. And even for me, the way that we are thinking about security or thinking about the best way to bridge between chains changes all the time. Um, on top of that, it's also a honeypot. So because you lock funds up, you are become a really attractive target to hackers. And it's not just like the custodied assets to create the minted assets are the only ones that could be locked on the bridge. If you have a high latency bridge, you could also have assets to like that kind of represent more of a liquidity network. If you're not the default bridge, then you're probably going to want some type of AMM to switch into the asset that everybody really wants. And that is, that's just all a lot of money that is an appealing target. Uh, and the other reason why these bridge hacks keep happening is because bridge technology is pretty complex. Like you are building a system that is connecting a lot of heterogeneous domains. So not only do you have to know everything about your system, but you have to know everything about the underlying domains that, that you're connecting. Because the code that you write will not run the same on Optimism or Arbitrum or Polygon. There are slight differences that will impact you because those slight differences that you may not understand fully uh, are going to be the ones that end up being your downfall. So. Now we're going to talk about like the different types of bridges that exist and some of like just to give you guys a easier mental model to evaluate all the bridges. Uh, so first, before we get into that, um, you can't have all the nice things. You're going to have to choose some. And there's always trade-offs like in any other type of engineering. Uh, generally, it means that you can't have all four of these properties. It's low latency, meaning the transfers or message passing happens quickly. It's generalizable, meaning you can pass whatever messages you'd like through the bridge. It's trust minimized, meaning that you're not adding any additional trust assumptions. Or it's extensible, meaning you can take the same implementation and use it on many different domains. Um, you can also have 
there's a missing triangle, but you can also have low latency, trust minimized, and extensible bridges. Those are more like liquidity networks, like atomic transfers would have that because you can't pass general data through. You can only pass uh, fungible tokens. Uh, cool. So what types of bridges exist and where do they exist on this trade-off space? There's natively verified bridges, and natively verified bridges are bridges where the domain's underlying validators are the ones that are verifying these transactions. Uh, this is something like light client bridges, ZK bridges, the uh, which are coming out now, uh, or like even the roll-up AMBs are a special ver special case of this type of bridge. Um, they are very low latency. You can pass whatever information you want through them, and they are trust minimized. However, they are not extensible, and they're not extensible because generally these bridges depend really heavily on the underlying consensus of the domains that they're connecting. So I would need a completely diff I would need two different bridges if I were creating a project that would use light client bridges everywhere. I would need two different implementations uh, on Ethereum if I wanted to connect from Ethereum to Cosmos or Ethereum to Solana. Uh, there's also externally verified bridges. Externally verified bridges have a third-party validator set that's verifying these bridge transactions. Um, this is low latency, generalizable, and extensible, but now you do have to consider what happens with that third-party validator set. The implications of like whether or not the bridge validator set is going to be the lowest trust point in your system really depends on like the validators of the domains that you're connecting. So if you're connecting flip-flop chain through a very popular bridge to Ethereum, your weakest val verifier set's probably going to be on flip flop chain. Uh, okay, cool. And then there's optimistically verified systems. Optimistically verified systems use fault proofs to uh, enforce the validity and veracity of the messages that they're passing through. Uh, one quirk about how you have to construct the fault proofs for these types of systems is you can only uh, prove that fraud happened on the home domain, which is where the message was sent from. Generally, that's because all of most optimistic systems have some type of Merkle root that they are verifying, and you can only prove that your claim of fraud was valid if you know the contents that went into that Merkle tree. Uh, however, on the destination domains, you can disconnect the, uh, the chain so they don't process any fraudulent messages. These systems are trust minimized, generalizable, and extensible, but obviously they have, they are, have some latency because you have to run a fault proof. Uh, so I also want to talk briefly about ZK bridges, just because they are coming out soon, but they're not available yet. ZK bridges are a type of native bridge that you know, uses a validity proof to ensure consensus. One thing that you have to consider with any native bridge where it's just, or any proof where it's just asserting consensus is if there's a 51% attack on one of the domains, that malicious information would uh, be treated as valid when it's crossing a bridge that verifies only consensus. There's some really interesting work to validate both consensus and state transitions, but it's in early days. Ultimately, that's probably going to be the gold standard of bridges, but it's not ready for prime time yet. Um, so now we're going to talk about different types of security and where these bridges fare in those trade-offs. So when we talk about security of these cross-domain systems, we're really talking about three different types of security. Economic security, which is how much does it cost to, like what, what damage could a really well-funded adversary do to your system? Implementation is like how complex is it to build and reason about? Um, and also, implementation talks about your standard development practices, like do you have good security hygiene? And then there is environmental security. Environmental security is basically how can, it, you can think of bridges as an oracle of information from two different domains. And if you think of them that way, then you have to ensure the quality of the information as it transfers from a low security domain to a high security domain. So what I mean by that is like if flip-flop chain is, you have a bridge that's connecting flip-flop chain to Ethereum, and that bridge flip-flop chain is 51% attacked, how does your system handle passing that information that may be uh, maliciously, malicious? So economic security, what's your price? Uh, how much does it cost to corrupt all of your validators? Basically, the only great way to kind of constrain this risk is to have a permissionless and diverse validator set. Uh, otherwise, you... Everybody does have some sort of bribery price. Uh, so natively verified bridges to kind of break them on their economic security, you have to corrupt the domain's underlying validator set. Uh, for uh, externally verified systems, you have to corrupt their bridge validator set. And again, like 
Whether or not that's the weakest validator set depends a lot on the chains that you're connecting. Um, and then optimistically verified systems, there's a few different ways you could corrupt the economic security of these systems. The first is that you bribe all of the watchers, which ideally this is a permissionless thing to join. So if you can do that, th that would be really expensive and difficult to do and you wouldn't even really be able to dox all of them. Um, but also you could censor the destination domain or censor the home domain so that it becomes impossible to actually submit a fraud proof or a disconnect transaction. Uh, so in terms of like where all these system ranks, native is probably it's going to be the most secure for economic security, followed by optimistic and external. And again, this is largely dependent on the permissionlessness and diversity of your verifier set. OK, so implementation security. How simple is it? Like your bridges already have a massive surface area because they're connecting, like dealing with a heterogeneous environment. Um, so those dependencies will trickle up. And it's something that you have to deal with. So the only way to really mitigate that, that type of implementation risk is to constrain your surface area, uh, which means you should probably talk to your theoretical physics friends because they're really good at that. But implementation security is not just how simple your system is. It's also all about code hygiene, all about development practices, all about security mindset. Like, do you fuzz your test? Do you have audits? Do you have, what's your test coverage? Are your bug bounties live? Have you done war games? Um, you can also constrain this implementation risk by building your systems defensively. And what I mean by that is integrating things like rate limits. So if you're a bridge and somebody's withdrawing $10, that's probably fine. You can probably let that happen. But if somebody's withdrawing 90% of the value in your bridge in a single transaction, maybe you want to add some delays or some extra verification on that so that people can uh, react appropriately. Um, so for natively verified bridges, they are pretty complicated because you have to deal with the underlying consensus set, and so you really need a unique bridge implementation for each domain pair that you're connecting. Uh, for externally verified systems, it's really nice because you can take the exact same system and put it on pretty much any domain. The complexity comes from uh, the like off-chain coordination between the verifier set. Anytime that you have to have coordination between multiple actors, it becomes more complex. With optimistic systems, uh, you don't need that off-chain coordination between all of the watchers and so that they really have an advantage in terms of implementation security. So yeah, optimistic wins here, followed by external, and then native bridges actually do the worst. So now we're talking about environment security. So again, like bridges are oracles of information from one domain to another. And you need to make sure that your system can vouch for the quality of that information. Uh, you can constrain environment, the, really the best way to do that is to add off-chain checks. Like 51% attacks are really difficult to check on-chain, and uh, you want to be able to add equivalency checks to and delays to your information so that you don't respond immediately to in data that could be malicious. Uh, so natively verified systems, these happen synchro synchronously. As soon as like it passes consensus, it could pass through the mechanisms of nati natively verified bridges, uh, which means that if there is a 51% attack, you don't really have a strong defense against that. Um, for externally verified bridges, it's really easy to insert these types of equivalency checks and these types of delays, but it's not required by the model by default. Um, whereas in optimistic bridges, the delay is like embedded in how the protocol works. So these checks are kind of treated as a first class citizen. Uh, so yeah, optimistic bridges best here, external and then native. Uh, so, woohoo, optimistic bridges, like probably the best. But that doesn't really matter that much because that's not like where we're getting attacked. The hacks that we see, the bridge hacks that we see, they're almost all at this implementation level. So, in terms of attack difficulty, it requires way less resources to be able to uh, exploit the implementation of a bridge and like exploit the implementation risk. If you're going to do an economic attack, you're probably going to need a lot of money. Uh, and if you're doing an environmental attack, so like corrupting the validators, uh, well, you're going to need a lot of money and probably a lot of know-how as well. And we're not seeing any of those types of attacks. Those are pretty rare. What we're seeing all the time is these implementation keys. The one, the one exception being Ronin. Uh, Ronin is like a multi-sig bridge where they have uh, some number of signers have to verify all the transactions. I would argue, and those keys got compromised, the bridge got drained for hundreds of millions of dollars. 
I would argue that that was, again, an implementation failure in guarding your keys more than an attack on the economic model of the bridge. Uh, so if implementation security is like the most accessible thing for us to solve, a lot of that comes from thinking simply, but also from the decades of prior cybersecurity processes and research that we have. Why are we still having so many hacks? And the reality is like security doesn't exist in a vacuum. All of the projects that are creating bridges right now are young and they are resource constrained. And when you are creating a project of any type, like hacks are a low probability, high impact event. And there are several other things that could kill your project. So you are going to be forced into making uh, different types of trade-offs. So a lot of the trade-offs that people make when they actually ship bridges is to take some type of shortcut. Uh, the most common shortcuts that you'll see are whitelist, upgradability, and centralization. So if you're LPing on a bridge, that's probably going to be gated behind a whitelist. If you're an external validator, most bridges have those, oops, sorry, have those gated behind whitelists as well. Um, there's also upgradability. Upgradability is controversial. It's not clear whether it's better to have an opt-in or an opt-out system, since you'll want an opt-out system to fix emergency bugs, but you'll want an opt-in system to allow projects to kind of change their security risk at their own, at their leisure. But most of the time, the upgrade systems that are in place on all of these bridges are just instant upgrade by an admin multi-sig, uh, which obviously kind of undermines the entire security model that most teams advertise, and quite frankly, it's mostly a branding exercise. Uh, and then you also have elements of centralization. Uh, that means like possibility, you have centralized supporting services. So in Bridges, actually, if you are running your own node, or running your own node is just as important as like securing your keys. And the reason for that is if you don't run your own node, you could get malicious events. And generally, as you're a, an LP, like most Bridges function by watching for events on source chain validating them and sending them out on destination chain. And if you you have are connected to a malicious node provider, then that event is incorrect and you could have just sent them a lot of money. Uh, so these are all things that, common shortcuts that bridge projects take because right now they're trying to de-risk their unknown unknowns. Like, is this even the best way to pass information? What are the RPC qualities like on the domains that I'm connecting to? There's a lot of other things that go into creating a secure protocol. Uh, so that means that there are some practical considerations that aren't the most tasteful that are important for you as a user when you're evaluating your security. Uh, so the first one is, is this my life now? Which basically means you have to understand how long you're exposed to the risk of the bridge. So if you are using a, assets that came from a default bridge, not even the default bridge itself, you are still exposed to that bridge risk. If you are using uh, or LPing on a bridge for either the AMM or just as a liquidity provider of some other type, um, you really will be exposed to the risk of that bridge for the duration of the time that you are LPing. If you're a user and you're crossing a bridge and it's not the default bridge, so something like Hop or Connect, um, you're only exposed to the risk while you're crossing. Now, the other one to check is like, where are your receipts? What have you done? Like the Lindy effect is incredibly powerful in bridges, but it should reset every time that there is an upgrade. So you have to look at how long it takes, how long bridges have been securing a large amount of money. And that's a really good proxy for how secure it is because if there's a lot of money there, uh, it's probably an appealing target. And so people have probably tried to hack it and can't. That being said, just because it's been around for a, long, a while doesn't mean there's not a bug in it. Uh, and then the other one, this is like the most unfortunate to have to consider because it's kind of against the ethos of the space, but uh, because bridge projects take these shortcuts, it is really important to, uh, and are kind of running on training wheels. It is really, really important to know if you can trust the judgment of the team. Do you know that they follow good development practices? Do you trust that if something went wrong, they would continue working on the project. Um, and if you're not capable of evaluating like the specific de development processes and hygiene of the team, then you really do need to lean on social signaling for other people who would vouch for that, who do have more knowledge. It's kind of unfortunate that that, that, that ends up what, being what we have to fall back on, but until these bridges are really standalone systems, that just kind of is your best bet. 
So now we have time for questions. We have about five minutes. Um. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Yo, thank you. That was great. <laughs> Uh, how do you how do you make your own considerations? So you're talking about getting some shortcuts regarding like uh, the weighing off like security and speed, like time to deploy, time for time to production. How do you how do you weigh those things that connects? How do you make the decision of say centralizing some aspects, for example? Yeah, well, so I can tell you exactly what our shortcut was. So and our NXTP v zero. Uh, that's kind of an atomic transfer system and how it works is you have a trans you run an auction process and then lps can bid on facilitating your transfer users select the winning lp that's great all of that needs to happen on a messaging server we use a centralized messaging server because figuring out how this would work in the wild and how it's like kind of what our risk to a business was, figuring out decentralized messaging was not high on that like decision matrix priority. It just wasn't something that we would be able to focus on. Um, I think like as we've matured as a project, we've started to kind of realize that it is really important when you're not sure about the entire security of your system because you have no Lindy, it's really, really important to make sure that there are some controls that you can enact. Like, pausing the system is incredibly important, especially right. as it increases in complexity. And, and practically speaking, in your team, who, like, how, was the, how did you come about that decision? Did you involve everyone? Like, was it like, more strategic? Like... Uh, for the centralized messaging, uh, we asked some of the ETH2 folks if they would recommend Live P2P, and they said, absolutely not. And so we were like, OK. okay. <laughs> um, so you, you talked about the dangers, like how you lose your lindiness when you upgrade a bridge. Um, I'm curious if you have specific ideas about like the testing and uh, the, yeah, the testing procedures that you would have specific to upgrades to make sure that super like, strong, I, super strong opinions about that personally. Yeah I, <laughs> yeah, I think like you at the very least, you should set up a hard hat or forge project that forks the mainnet URL and runs a bunch of fuzzing and unit tests against the upgrade that you've performed. But I think beyond that, like, that's great. You need to have a separate mainnet testbed contract environment where you can run these tests and then you need to do some fire drills, like red team, blue team. So we work with Spearbit to do this kind of external attacks on our system. And we'll get, like, if, obviously, if it's a real bug, you know, please don't do that to us on mainnet. Uh, but we'll give them upgrade keys to kind of inject a bug, and then we'll test our monitoring systems. Like, how quickly can we pause things if it went wrong? Like, how quickly can we get our incident response team together? Because I think that if you have to figure those things out when it's under the gun, you're in a lot of trouble. So we're going to do our first one on our upcoming uh, fork probably in the next few weeks here. But um, we'll give them like a two-week time frame and say, OK, sometimes within this two week, get it. And if I really wanted to be mean, I'd be like, do it while I'm asleep, because <laughs> which I, I probably will. <laughs> uh, I was just curious, uh, do, would you recommend uh, adding latency to increase security, or Definitely. it doesn't really? Anything. Definitely. I think until you're able to prove the validity of state transitions and not just consensus, then your only way to mitigate like your risk of 51% attacks is to have latency in your system. Awesome. Thanks, guys.